1871 sees the war with Prussia and the Commune. Cezanne's a draft dodger hiding out here in Provence. After all the burning and bloodshed in Paris, the painter Lucien Pissarro invited Cezanne to paint with him in the Paris suburbs. Pizarro on the right, Cezanne on the left. They're about to set out on a painting trip. They look sturdy and workmanlike. It was from Pizarro that Cezanne learned Impressionism. With that, the violent mood inside stayed inside, while on canvas, Cezanne started to produce something much more slow-burning. April 1874, the first Impressionist show. Invited by Monet to take part, Cezanne pays his 60 francs subscription, and amongst the works he puts in, he includes this parody of Manet. It's called A Modern Olympia. The prostitute's client is painted in. It's Cezanne with his bald head, but wearing the dandy outfit that Manet was always photographed in, clothes that Cezanne would never wear, black frock coat and cane, and on the chaise longue, the aristocratic top hat. Cezanne draws attention to himself by identifying himself with a scandalous figure, Manet. At the same time, he mocks Manet and he mocks himself. A therapist today would say it's a cry for help. Manet thinks it's rubbish. He can't bear Cezanne. One of the reasons he won't be in the first Impressionist show is Cezanne. Degas can't bear him either. No one likes him. What's the problem? Trouble at home? This is the Just de Buffon, the Cezanne family estate just outside of Aix. Cezanne paints at the Jass. That's the top floor room his father had converted into a studio for him. That's good. What's bad is domestic life here, which is intolerable. It's all based on his father's complete irrationalism. In 1878, when Cezanne's nearly 30, his father opens a letter to him from one of the Impressionist buyers. In it, he learns that not only does Cezanne have a lover, but also a son. He decides that when Cezanne goes to Paris, he keeps several women in rooms there. He fights with Cezanne and temporarily cuts down his allowance. But years later, when Cezanne's father has a flirtation with one of the maids at the Jacques de Buffon, he temporarily increases his allowance. In 1886, Cezanne is nearly 50, but still in that year, his mother and sister and his father, who's now nearly 90, are able to pressurise Cezanne for the sake of respectability to finally marry Hortense. The wedding takes place. It's a bleak event because they don't love each other. A few months later, Cezanne's father dies and Cezanne becomes a wealthy man from the inheritance. Cezanne is now the boss of the jazz. But instead of this cheering him up, he becomes convinced that his own death is drawing near and that all human interaction is futile. He lives here with his mother and sister running the household. He quite likes them, but on the whole, nobody in this family likes each other. Hortense does endless modelling sessions for Cezanne, but they have nothing in common. She hates his mother and sister. His mother and sister hate each other and hate her. She spends as much time as she can away from X, living in Paris with her and Cezanne's son, who's now a teenager. All the connections in this human tangle tend to be negative, suspicion and paranoia. Renoir once came down to stay at the Jazz during this period, but he had to leave early, he said, because of the black avarice that reigns here. What's happening with his paintings? Well, we've reached the real Cezanne style, mature Cezanne, this titanic figure in art history. How do you make modern art that is at the same time like the old masters, that holds together and has an impact for the ages, not just for the moment? That's the aim. Will he achieve it? That's the question. He doesn't know. He's always racked with doubts. This is a portrait of Hortense from the 1880s. Here's another from the same time. She's hardly there in either as a personality, but both are still very moving emotionally. 
It's because of the tenderness. It's a dissociated thing. One state makes up for another. The schematic, anonymous cipher of a figure, emotionless. The loose paint, nuanced, melting, delicate, tender, conveying emotion instead. It's still Impressionism, but in a way that's solid as well as atmospheric. It's a mixture of Monet's darting observant alertness to light and colour in nature, Manet's patterned arrangements, Courbet's roughness and frankness with the physical stuff of paint. A mixture of all that into a slowly built up, carefully ordered arrangement. His art is composed and ordered, but he's even more eccentric than when he was young. He's a rebel against anything established, but he suddenly becomes a devout Catholic. He goes to the Mass every Sunday at the cathedral, pays careful attention to every word of the sermon, and has his chains ready for the beggars outside. He says, I want to share in what it was like to be in the Middle Ages. His painting is the most revolutionary type of art there's ever been, but he suddenly becomes politically conservative. He won't tolerate any left-wing views being expressed, even if it's people who support his art and the work of the artists that he used to like. He says the supporters of Impressionism are only intellectuals, a type he can't stand. He can't stand anyone who's only clever. He spends years being driven mad by not getting any success, and then when he gets it, it drives him mad too. In 1886, one of the dealers of the Impressionists puts on a show of Cezanne in Paris. A few of the paintings sell to writers and poets. Degas and Renoir draw lots to see who will get the best still lives. And now there's a stream of articles in the papers. The former idiotic shocker has become a cult figure. It's a tiny cult, only artists and a few writers. The general audience still thinks Cezanne is mad. Meanwhile, the cultists go on pilgrimages to X to watch him work, to work with him and bring back reports of his conversations. He tells them he's looking at Poussin. Here's a picture by Poussin. He's a classicist from the 17th century. He paints idealised scenes of nature. They have biblical meanings or meanings from classical culture. In Cezanne's time, salon art pays a false homage to this kind of thing, trivialising its greatness with salon sweetness. The salon hates Cezanne. But Cezanne wants to do something that really will connect the high Renaissance tradition of creating a marvellous illusion of reality done wholly in the studio using old master trickery. He wants to connect that with the sensations he experiences out in the marvellous raw reality of nature. I want to redo Impressionism after Poussin, he says, or redo Poussin after nature. It comes to the same thing. Cezanne's interest in Poussin is an interest in solidity. Courbet, who Cezanne also admires, is interested in that too. But for Cezanne, who has the lesson of Monet as well as Courbet, solidity must be connected to its opposite. The fleeting, the fugitive, the changeable and the ephemeral. 